Hi class, um, this is our chapter seven recording. We're gonna do telecommunications, internet, and wireless technology. This is really a snippet of my um, data communications class that I teach at the graduate school level. Um, and it fits nicely with what we just talked about, which was real infrastructure. Um, I skipped database until uh, next week, so that's why we're doing chapter seven now. So what we hope to look at is the principal components of telecommunications and different types of networks. Um, we're going to look at the internet and how they support e-business. And we're going to look at the standards for wireless networking. Our homework for um, this week will be the telepresence video. Um, it's a very nice case to look at. So what's going on in networking and communications today? We're sending more and more um, different types of data over one connection medium. Medium is simply a type of cable. And that's what the first bullet's all about, convergence. Telephone networks, computer networks, even TV networks using the same standards over the same either copper or fiber optic um, cable. And we'll learn more about those types of cables um, within this presentation. So if I were to ask you all, what is broadband? What would you all say? Okay, good, it's high-speed internet access. Um, and about 74% of all US internet users have broadband access. Um, I think that's kind of low. Um, but we do have a lot of rural areas, a lot of poor areas that maybe people can't get internet service for or simply can't afford to pay for. Um, lower populated countries with higher per capita incomes like Denmark, Sweden, Finland, um, that percentage is upwards of 100%. Broadband wireless is where we have voice and data going over a wireless platform, whether it's through LTE or um, Wi-Fi enabled or smart Internet of Things enabled devices. So what's a computer network? Well, we all know what LinkedIn is, where um, we get on it to try to network with other professionals. Maybe we hope to build our career or enhance other people's careers. Well, a computer network is similar. We can't have LinkedIn with just one person. The same thing with a computer network we need two or more connected computers. And my networking background goes way back to a network where um, <coughs> um, a friend of mine, parents, owned a mobile home park in Walden, New York. I was in, um, an undergrad at the time. I believe it was like 1987 where they wanted to computerize some network, some not network, some files that they had for renting a property. And I physically connected two devices together and shared software on one with the other, which was a, my first instance of networking. From there, we had some within the St. John's environment, early stages of networking. I really didn't get into what we know as Ethernet or TCP IP networking until I became the director of technology at the Millbrook School some 20 years ago, 25 years ago. There's where we finally looked at Ethernet, Cat5 and 6 cable, and some higher speed access um, within a campus environment. So what makes up a network? We need clients and servers, going back to that client-server model of computing we've looked at already. We need networking cards or interface cards. The connection medium is simply cable or wireless devices. We need network operating systems. We need routers and switches. A router is simply a device that connects one network to another and provides us, much like the word says, a route from getting from one point to another. You can think of a router as a GPS device in, say, your car. 
your car, if you hit the GPS icon, maybe in your touch screen, it knows how to get from point A to B. Router is the same thing. Programmers will go into a router, looks kind of like a computer, and will put in routes and it will know where to take data packets from a client and bring it to something on the internet. A switch is part of what's called a switch network, and it has many um, connection points for devices to come into. A switch will enable like an office network where we're connecting many devices to one router. And software-defined networking is where we manage the switches and routers and other devices through a central program. At Greystone, we're very innovative for the small nonprofit healthcare sector in that we use software-defined networking through an appliance called FortiManager from the company Fortigate, F-O-R-T-I-G-A-T-E dot com, great company to research. Um, they provide lower cost, higher function network devices. We have firewalls and firewalls just like in your homes where your boiler is. If you have a boiler in your home, around that boiler there'll be fire rated sheetrock, which is meant to suppress flame should something happen with the boiler. But a firewall in the IT setting is the same. It usually sits on the perimeter of our network. Um, after our router or before our router and it determines what can and come into our network. So this diagram is just a simple diagram depicting a network. We have two client PCs connected to one switch, can a server connected to another switch, connected to a router and to the internet. In a more complex network, we would have a core switch, which would probably take up like 128 PCs and servers connected, stored centrally or into IT closets. And we would connect switches via fiber optic cable between closet to closet to data center to provide connections for a vast amount of employees, usually going out on one high speed um, connection through our router. So our high speed connection to the internet goes into our router. And here's a discussion on large uh, companies. I want to talk around this slide with the diagram. So kind of what I was talking about, we have a wire network in our organization. So Sam here at Greystone, we have wire connections for some of our employees, some use the wireless network, which is here. Um, with our wireless network, we connect to our central firewall connected to the internet. We use what's called voice over IP. So our phone systems connect to the internet as well, not through us, a telephone provider. Our mobile phones and smartphones can either use the LTE network from Verizon or they'll connect to our wireless network. Our servers, though depicted here as physical servers, we use what's called virtual servers. We discussed virtualization in Chapter 5 in a data center in Chicago and Arizona. So we connect them through our routers via what's called a tunnel. A tunnel is like the Holland Tunnel, how you get from New Jersey to New York, New York, or Manhattan to Brooklyn or Queens, any one of the tunnels there. Same thing with a tunnel in IT. It's how we connect one location to another. There'll be an exam question on client-server computing. Um, it was the first distributed model of computing. And you can look at it like this. You're the client, and we need to get a resource, say, from um, Google Docs. Maybe you're going to present your slides in Google Slides. So what we do, you go to your computer, you go to um, the link for Google Docs, you put in your user ID and password. That process is called authentication. Then once we're in Google's network, we launch the app for Docs. You launch the doc you want to present, then I'll launch 
Google Slides. Google Slides will then go and get your data and present it back to you. Doing so looks like a seamless process, but it's not. There's many steps along the way and many servers. So we, when we go to google.com, we go to what's called a web server. That's where all the images and page layouts of all the websites are stored. Each company will have their own website. From there, that web server is connected to an application server, which holds the key applications to launch once data has been retrieved, i.e. Google Slides. So when we launch Google Slides, we send a query to a database, queries a request for information, to a database server. All the while, we've already been authenticated to Google's network through an authentication server. This model of computing is much lower cost and less transaction cost than the old um, mainframe computing model. This model is prevalent today. Packet switching is a way of slicing messages into smaller pieces and sending them along the way. Can you imagine if you had uh, downloaded the latest, maybe you stole a copy of Captain Marvel. I don't believe in stealing movies or bit turns. They're illegal and I'm very big on intellectual property. Let's say you all did. You can't possibly download that entire movie in one shot. You do it bit by bit, packet by packet, and over a switched network. And this um, diagram shows that. So on the left, we have a packet with a header of data, including the whole message. So the packet goes from point to point, route to route, until it's reassembled. So we have one packet broken up into three. It makes it easier to send throughout the connection medium, and it's reassembled. TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, is the foundation of the Internet as we know it. It provides us the rules on how we connect between one or more devices. It's also the protocol that has enabled a global environment in the Internet itself. TCP IP is uh, universally accepted as a connection medium for the Internet. It has four layers, an application, transport, internet, and network layer, of which you're not going to be responsible for. However, if you were an IT major and taking the data communication course, this would be on your midterm. Network interface, internet, transport, application layer, just like we just talked about. Types of networks. A modem is what's called a modulator, demodulator. You may hear the term today with cable modems. Well, back when I was in y'all seats, we didn't have online learning, so I was in a classroom. But we would connect to networks remotely through a modem connected to our telephone line, and it sounded something like this. You dial the number. And it would ring on the other side and finally connect, and it would sound like this. <laughs> then you may hear something like, you got mail. So what all that did was it took a digital signal from my laptop, desktop, whatever I have, converts that to an analog signal. An analog signal is, you remember, your sine curve from trigonometry class. Maybe it was algebra 2. And then it converts it back to digital. We have some uh, types of networks that we typically look at. There'll be an, probably an exam question on this. We have local area networks, which is confined to one building. We have wide area networks like we have here at Greystone where we connect 18 locations into one. We have a metropolitan area network where we connect two locations in one city kind of look at maybe Ernst & Young or Citibank in New York City where they have many offices connected to one network. And lastly is a campus area network. You can think of a campus area network like Foxnet or maybe 
when you go into one of Amazon or Facebook's campuses and the building is located in that campus all connect to one uh, router before we go out to the internet. As we talked about before with the modem, our computer sends a digital signal of zeros and ones. Our modem turns it into an analog signal so it can go out telephone lines or through a cable system. And then it takes the sine curve and moves it back to zeros and ones. We take a look at transmission medium now, how we get things from one point to another. The first is a uh, twisted pair wire. If we were in class, I'd have examples of all well, these cables prevalent. Um, so twisted pair is a copper wire with a thin plastic coating over it. And the copper wires are um, twisted before they're connected into an RJ45 jack. A coaxial cable I hope you've all seen. It's a thick black shielded cable with one strand of copper sticking out of the middle of it for a connecting cable. Um, fiber optic cable is usually an orange based cable of glass and it sends light waves. Other mediums are our cellular network and our satellite network. How we measure what we get as a service, it's through bits per second. You always say, well, how fast do you connect? Oh, I'm connected at a gigabit per second, very fast. And we can look at things like hertz and bandwidth as well. So the internet, we all know what the internet is, given to us by good old um, Bob Dole. It started out as a way to combat Eastern Europe and the Soviets during the Cold War and let our militaries really communicate to each other. Then we opened it up for everyone to see. Well, the internet's not owned by any one particular entity, but pieces of it are broken up into internet service providers. And that was the whole foundation around that net neutrality. If an ISP has been provided a certain block of the internet, why can't they do what they want? The internet's also the world's largest wide area network because it's made up of many devices connected via routers. Speeds. Hopefully we can all afford some high speed internet and this slide really needs to be updated. So please take note, dial up is still 56K. DSL is between 385K and about five megabits per second. Fios, on the other hand, is an exclusive technology to Verizon, and it goes up to a gigabit per second. Cable internet connections go between 100 and 1,000 megabits per second, so let's update that, and I'll update the slide and send it out, you guys, or put it up on Island after the presentation. Satellite's the slowest medium. T1 and T3 is what's called least lines. A T1 is 1.54 megabits per second. A T3 is, in essence, three of those bonded together to give us a 45 megabit per second. There's other connection mediums like DS3, built on an MPLS network. So my home is 65 Western Avenue, Marlboro, New York. That's where, that's where I live. Where do I live on the internet? Well, that's my IP address. So it could be 10.10.78.x. And that's how the internet knows me. That's a private IP address. What my router does through a something called network address translation, it takes that 10.10 um, address and gives it a different one. So it really hides my identity. Domain name system, DNS. What it does, it takes these IP addresses and puts it onto a host name. So if you go to amazon.com, that's actually associated to an IP address. Okay. If you guys have a Windows-based computer, 
you can type in the Cortana box, run, and then type in T-R-A-C-E-R-T -E space www.amazon.com and you would get a bunch of IP addresses. It shows your steps from where you initiated the request to Amazon. And finally, when it gets to Amazon, you would then find out the IP address associated in DNS with Amazon. There's a midterm question on domain name system, and it's broken up like this. We have the root level. Then we have things like .edu, .com, .gov as our top level. There's .ny, .us, .this and that. You know, there's so many more top level domains now. We have a second level domain, which is really your website name. Google, Expedia, Congress, Greystone Programs. We have a third level domain which breaks up our organization into departments. And lastly, we have our host computer name. So in essence, this computer listed in this slide is computer1.sales.google.com. Because computer1 is in the sales organization within google.com. I already talked about how the, no one owns the internet, it's broken up to ISPs. A lot of ISPs are regional cable companies or telephone companies. Um, and realize that there's not a lot of competition out there either. Usually municipalities sign contracts with either a cable company or a phone company to provide service in their town. So we're a little ahead of the game. We already talked about the battle over net neutrality a couple times already. The IP address I referenced before, the 10.10.78.x, is what's called an IPv4 address. It's being replaced with what's called IPv6 because we've run out of IPv4 um, addresses due to the explosion of smartphones, tablets, uh, other connected devices like Internet of Things. So we have a, a new approach to it. Internet 2 is something that's being developed now, um, usually for governments or educational institutions, very high speed to test leading technologies for Internet access. Things we get from the Internet email, chatting, news groups not really used anymore, telnet and FTP not really used anymore, and World Wide Web, which is simply a browser. <coughs> Excuse me. Voice over IP, it's the process that's really displaced traditional phone systems, where we use our data network, our IP network, to send voice signals from a telephone from one place to another. There's an example of a voice over IP phone. This is a CAT6 cable with an RJ45 connection to it. And back to my lovely face. We've discussed this model already a couple times. Well, let's discuss client server a little more. We look at us sending a request to the internet. It then goes to a server where we route either web traffic or email traffic, working with DNS along the way. It goes to an application server, then to a database server, where we find out what we have to render back to the client goes back to the application server saying, hey, I need that Google.com search page for um, Sony remote controls. So that brings that page back to us. You should be able to represent this diagram in your exam question one way or another, either verbally or drawn out. VPNs, virtual private networks, they do two things for us. 
They're less extended capabilities of our local area network or wide area network. They provide secure encrypted private networks over the internet. And they're done in a few ways. And I'm going to upload a tunneling diagram from my network here at Greystone. We use VPN tunnels to connect all of our locations to our Chicago and Arizona data centers. And trans that's a two-way um, travel, so we have lanes in both directions. So we can get from New York to New Jersey if you're going over one of the, the city tunnels. Same thing in I tape. So we can get data from our Armenia house to Chicago and back to our Armenia house. We also have an application that allows us to have VPN tunnels from our workstations. So it allows our employees to work from home. So we've really extended the capabilities of our organization to many locations and 24 seven. Leads to competitive advantage, right? One of the reasons why we put systems in place to begin with. We've talked over voice over IP works already, not really important. So, our question for the lecture today is this slide. Management, monitoring employees on networks, unethical or good business? I'd like you to answer these questions briefly for me. Should managers monitor employee email and internet usage? Describe an effective email or web policy for users? And should managers inform employees that they're being monitored? Um, so, you know, I believe it's ethical and good business to let our employees know that email is corporate property, internet is corporate property. You have to use it as our acceptable use policy indicates. While I do not actively monitor traffic from our employees or emails, I do have the capabilities to do so. Um, I only really do so should there be a problem or a breach, breaches an intrusion on our network, but I believe it's wholly ethical and good business. I would like your own thoughts, put a little research into it, read what the chapter is all about, use my thoughts and um, come about what you think, maybe use your experience from jobs or internships you've already had. What makes up the web? Well, the web, the internet is made up of web pages, usually written in HTML or some other language that will render the page. Packets are moved through hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP. The whole thing around DNS, it allows us to no longer type HTTP. It's known as the universal standard for connected to DNS. URL, our uniform resource locator, is simply www.maris.edu. That's the three parts of the DNS name that we seen earlier, simply the URL. Web server stores our web pages as we've already discussed. I think we all pretty know how we search on the internet, um, but we're gonna look more in the semester about how Google actually does it. We can add shopping bots. We can do search engine optimization, which we're looking to do here at Greystone. We're actually redesigning our corporate website, a project that I'm project managing for Greystone. We've contracted with a company called Forefront out of Columbus, Ohio to rebuild our website. So it has keywords on our pages that search engines will find. The higher up on a page rank system with Google you are, the more clicks you're ultimately going to get. Top US web pages as of 2018. Google's about 64%, every Bing is about 21%, Yahoo is about 12%, and so on. We discussed already um, Google's acquisition of YouTube and what it spawned from there. That was also in direct competition with Yahoo, who at the time of that transaction had a majority share for um, searches. Uh, and as we see now, 2019, Google is probably about 80% of 
all search engine um, searches. Here's how Google actually works. So a user, us, we type a query into Google. So let's search for um, possibilities. I'm looking at a picture right now during um, a break here at Greystone. Um, using my lunch to record our video today. It's just possibilities. It's sunset at a pier. So let's search for possibilities picture. It goes to Google where a bunch of web servers, which are very low end desktop like computers linked together, parse that query. It sends it to Google's index servers. And what an index is, it organizes our data in such a way that makes it um, searchable and more rapidly searched. From there, the results go to the PageRank system and where we look at those keywords and the algorithms used in this PageRank system, which Google contracts out for, will then provide the results back to us. I like to reference, this is a pretty cool drinking game. You're gonna get to a bar one day and someone's gonna say, hey, how's Google work? And you just remember this slide in your head and what I just talked about and you say, hey, I know how Google works. You just warn yourself a little something. Web 2.0, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on because it's there bits and pieces. It's really enabling collaboration and sharing of information. Um, it's born in the re-revolution of blogs. Um, blogs are what probably make up the a lot of websites these days in that um, a lot of the content we're putting up on pages is in blog form, which doesn't look like a blog to you and I, but it's blog based. Wikis, I hope you know, are user controlled content, not a really good source of um, research material, but good to build a little knowledge on. It's enabled our Facebooks, our Twitters, our Instagrams, our LinkedIn's, our Pinterest, and the like. Uh, spawned the explosion of big data, which we'll talk about in our database chapter where we're storing more than bits and bytes, we're storing videos, pictures, music files, all which we need a good way to quickly retrieve, i.e. big data. Web 3.0, I don't think anyone's calling it Web 3.0, but it means the Internet of Everything, where we see more of Internet of Things, Internet of People, uh, increasing cloud computing, um, more mobile connectivity, more web-enabled everything. Who ever thought refrigerators would have web access? Um, it's quite amazing technology, and we're going to put some of it in place to help our individuals here at Greystone. But who would who would think the need is there? But it really is. It's an amazing to think too. Later in the semester, when we look at launching a brand or launching our platform of whatever company we're looking at. We're going to look to build our social media presence first and get buzz out and more effectively manage our spend on our applications before we even build our website, all because of future web. <clears throat> Cellular. Um, as of 2019, there's one standard GSM, um, Verizon's in late 2018 dismissed their CDMA network. So everyone's on the same standards. We're getting speeds with 5G up to um, a gigabit per second on the cellular network. Uh, most of us can get 4G LTE, which is about 100 megs per second. Uh, still per, you know, pretty fast. We look at 3G networks, so if you ever see 3G on your phone, just give up because it's not really good for anything. And frankly, LTE is the 100 megabits per second speed. 4G is about 10 megabits per second, and it's um, pretty useless as well. So if we're not LTE or Wi-Fi, you might want to put your phones away. And 5G will explode this year with Verizon and um, AT&T 
fighting it out to see who's going to get those technologies up first. Something we've already discussed in class. Bluetooth is where we connect devices wirelessly over very short distances. Wi-Fi, I think we all know, is using wireless technologies to um, connect devices, usually through a wireless access point connected to a router or a switch. <clears throat> Excuse me. This slide's depicting things we can connect to Bluetooth. So we have our computer with Bluetooth enabled. We can connect a printer to it. A tablet's connected to a printer. Our smartphone can connect directly to a printer. We can throw our iPhones into a car and with Apple Play enabled, we can connect Bluetooth to Apple Play and we have our smartphone on our touchscreen in our vehicles. All the Bluetooth network, wireless headphones, you know, the, the AirPod craze, um, all enabled because of Bluetooth. Wireless LAN I talked about already. We have an access point connected to a router which is connected to the internet, and we have devices connected to it. What's important to know as the diagram shows you, this network can also support wired networks if the backbone is available. So we have CAT six or five cable in our office space with computers connected directly to switches, which should be depicted somewhere along this line, as well as an access point. So we have a hybrid network here of wired and wireless devices. RFID. RFID is radio frequency identification, and you can think of it as like easy pass. It's the easiest um, example where the little device that's attached to your window, your windshield, sends out radio signals over short distances to readers. And if you're driving on like the New York State Thruway and you're going maybe over the Tappan Zee Bridge and you can go through 55 miles an hour, or you're in New Jersey and going through the, the express lanes for easy pass, they have high speed readers that connect data from the device in your car. Also, within RFID, we've put in high shutter speed cameras that can collect data of your license plate. So tolling has completely changed, and probably by the end of 2021, we won't see tolls anymore. It'll all be camera and RFID. Much more cost-effective way for municipalities to get road access fees, tolls. Wireless sensor networks are really the foundation of Internet of Things. Internet of Things, IoT, smart homes all work off of sensors. Sensors are then um, connected to sensor hubs which connect to some kind of controller that allows us to control these low power, long lasting battery devices. An example I can use is the Blink network for my security cameras at my home. The cameras have wireless sensors uh, that can constantly communicate to a camera controller that's connected to my router. So I have access to the cameras around my home um, through my smartphone 24 seven. And that's it for this week, guys. We're going to answer that question about ethical or unethical to track email and internet usage. We're going to do our homework assignment. And I'm going to put up a forum question. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to be yet, but it'll be up today or tomorrow. And I recorded this on the 21st. So guys, thank you. I'm very happy with all the work I've been getting in. Quiz grades have been fabulous. Forum questions are great as well. But again, feel free to build on each other's answers. So we can have someone put up a response and then we can build on it and build on it. It's all an interactive place for us to learn from each other. 
Okay, guys, I appreciate all your efforts, and I will talk to you next week.